Tom. Hello. So thank you all for coming. Thanks for having me here. So uh, as Tom said, my name is Tyler, uh, and I work at Google. I'm also a member of the Apache Beam PMC. Uh, and if you're not familiar with what Beam is, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, this talk is about streaming SQL. Uh, there's a lot of interest in streaming these days, and SQL has been long been kind of one of the, the, the most uh, commonly used ways for, for dealing with data. Uh, and so this talk tries to give a, a foundation for, for reasoning about what streaming means in general and, and how it can relate uh, to SQL. Uh, and there's, there's two main sections uh, to this talk. So the first one covers uh, stream and table theory. So when I say streams and tables, how many of you have a rough idea of what I, what I mean by that? Actually, a pretty, pretty decent amount, maybe even half. So that's good. So we'll cover the basics real quickly. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how it relates to the, the way that we advocate uh, for doing data processing within Beam. Uh, and then in the second half, we'll finally talk about SQL. Uh, we'll do so at first by talking about uh, relational algebra and how it relates to streaming. And then finally, at the very end, we'll get to talking about SQL itself uh, and kinds of extensions you might want uh, in SQL to support streaming. Um, one brief note is uh, I wrote a book recently with a couple friends about streaming. I mention this because I can only go so deep on these topics in a 40-minute talk. Uh, and the talk's based off of two of the chapters in there. So if you're curious to learn more, I'd recommend looking at it. Uh, conversely, if you hate the talk, uh, you know you shouldn't buy the book. So that way, everybody wins. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so, so streams and tables. Uh, so when I talk about streams and tables, uh, I typically mean this in the way uh, that it was uh, presented within the Kafka community, primarily by Martin Kleppmann. Uh, here, here on the, the left, um, and also later, uh, Jay Kreps on the right. Uh, and the basic idea is that if you think about the way databases have worked for a long time, you know, you've got these tables uh, that people are kind of constantly making changes to, and, and those changes come into the database system, and they get serialized into a log. Uh, and then that log is applied over time uh, to yield you know, kind of the, those changes in, in, uh, in a materialized way in the table. Um, and so what, what Kleppmann said was you know, the, that stream of changes, that log of changes, is really your stream. And that, that aggregation of those changes over time yields the results of, of the table. Um, so that's kind of how you can go from a stream to a table. Uh, and then conversely, uh, you know, if you observe the changes to a table over time and kind of write those down as they happen, you can convert you know, the, this evolution of the table over time into a, a stream itself. And that's how you go from a table to a stream. So taking those two concepts, uh, and applying a bad physics analogy, you could get what I would call the special theory of, sh of stream and table relativity, which is you know, the aggregation of a stream over, uh, of updates over time yields a table, and the observation of changes to a table over time yields a stream. So this is a nice way to define streams and tables relative to one another. Uh, it's also useful to be able to understand how they were, uh, you know, what a table and a stream are independent from one another. And my, my favorite way of de defining those is to say that tables are data at rest. They're kind of this conceptual place for data to get grouped together and come and sit and reside, whereas streams are data in motion. They're kind of you know, the sequence of changes that are flowing from one place to the next. So that kind of does it for the basics of streams and tables. So now let's, look, let's go a little deeper and look at, at the way that Apache Beam uh, presents data processing and how that relates to streams and tables. So how many of you here know what Apache Beam is? So we're, Less people here, maybe 20, 30. So at its core, Apache Beam really is a, is a portability framework that lets you write data processing pipelines in one of many different SDKs and then run them on one of many different runners. Uh, what's particularly cool about it is that it, it, you know, as, as we kind of finish up the final vision of the, the portability framework within Beam is that it's going to allow you to do things like you know, run a pipeline written in Python or a pipeline written in Go on any of the supported runners, even if they're JVM-based or, or what have you. And this will really open up the door for lots of interesting use cases, I think, like supporting Node.js running on Spark or supporting C Sharp running on your, you know, whatever random runner you want to use. Um, <clears throat> but along with that, we've also tried to advocate pretty strongly for a certain way of thinking about data processing uh, within, the, within the SDKs that we provide. Uh, and we've done so kind of through this cute framework of, of four different questions. What results are calculated? Where in event time are the results calculated? When in processing time are the results materialized? And how do refinements of those results relate? Um, we'll talk about these more in detail, but, but 
later on. But, but briefly, you know, the, the what results are calculated. This is, you know, am I computing sums? Am I calculating histograms? Am I building machine learning models? This is kind of the thing you've always done with classic batch processing. Um, where in event times are results calculated? So this is, you know, do I just not care about time? Am I just computing, you know, from some pile of data some interesting output? You know, am I, am I aggregating things into daily windows or hourly windows? Am I computing user sessions, trying to understand user activity, things like that? Uh, when in processing time are results materialized? This question is, talks about, you know, when, when do you actually get your results? You know, again, with batch processing, it's, it's kind of always just worked one way. You, you have your input, and when it's all processed, you have your output. But when you're dealing with unbounded data and streaming, uh, you can't wait for the end of the input, because you know, in theory, it may never come, right? It's just this, this continuous stream of, of data coming in. So you know, do you want output when you, know, you think the input for a window is complete, or do you want like, periodic updates that kind of give you this, this, this eventual consistency sort of feel, like materialized views? Uh, and lastly, in those streaming cases where you have multiple, uh, multiple outputs for a given window, uh, how do refinements of those relate? Are they deltas of one another, or do they build upon each other? And if you had wrong answers previously, do you retract those? So this is kind of the, the mental framework that we try to have within, within Beam for thinking about uh, data processing. And we'll go through more examples later to, to make that a little more concrete. But if we want to reconcile what streams and tables mean uh, to the way Beam approaches data processing, I would argue there's there's kind of three main questions we'd want to answer. So one, since, since Beam supports both batch and stream processing uh, within the same framework, uh, and most of the streams and tables uh, discussions have happened in the, in the realm of, of streaming, we kind of need to answer this question of how does batch processing fit into all of this? Uh, and also, what is the relationship of streams to bounded and unbounded data sets? And then lastly, those four questions that we talked through of, of, uh, within the, sort of the Beam approach, well, how do those four questions map onto a streams and tables world? So to start out with, we'll try to answer the first two questions. And we'll do so within the, the framework of, of MapReduce. So how many, how many of you here are familiar with MapReduce? Almost everybody. Awesome. So this should be easy. So MapReduce, as you know, you've got an input source, some bounded data. It goes through these two phases, map and reduce. Uh, and at the end, you get this output. Um, for, our, for our purposes here, it's going to be better to think of these as six independent stages. So break apart the map and the reduce into a, a read kind of execute user function and write uh, transformation. So you've got map read, map, map write, then reduce read, uh, reduce, reduce write. Um, and in between each of these stages, uh, the data in the pipeline exists in some form, either a stream or a table. And we want to understand you know, what, what sort of what, what, what do they exist like at that point in time. Um, and as I'd said earlier, you know, we typically map reduce, you start with a bounded data set, and you end with a, a static bounded data set. That kind of feels like data at rest. It's just kind of sitting there. So I think it's safe to say that we start with a table and we end with a table. So the real question we have then is, what does all the stuff in the middle uh, end up as? And to do this initially, we'll, we'll just look at the map phase, and then we'll talk about the reduce phase later. Um, so if we want to understand what that first, uh, first question mark uh, is, it's useful, a good way to approach this would be to see that you know, for the map phase, the user is presented with a function that they have to implement, you know, the, their mapper. If we look at that function signature, we can figure out what the input to that is supposed to be. So this is a, a reasonable function signature for a, a, a Java uh, map phase. And it has two inputs, uh, a key and a value. And it also has, then it gets the emitter, which is the way that we produce outputs, which we'll talk about later. But basically what happens is you know, the, the map read phase goes and scans over some static data source. And as it, as it scans in records, one by one, it calls this map function. It says, here you go. Here's a key and a value. Go process and produce your outputs. And when that's done, it says, here's another key and a value. Go process it. And so it's just continually you know, handing off record after record to be processed. And that really kind of feels a lot like a stream, right? Like it's just a sequence of, of records being processed. So I think it's safe to say that the, the output of map read is, is a stream. So that, that read function going from the table is converting it into a stream and handing it off to the, to the user's mapper function. And then what's on the other side? Well, if we look at the output, uh, you know, the, the way the output is produced is with this emitter object that has a function on it, you know, emit or whatever, that you can call zero or more times per record uh, to produce output. Uh, and it, and it, uh, it's worth noting that the, the outputs are, are keyed here as well. So you, you know, it's, a, it's a key and a value. It can be a different type of key and a different type of value. But you can pr produce any arbitrary key value pair. Uh, they don't have to be related to anything. They can be totally random, or they could, all, you know, they could have some meaning to them. 
But the important point is here is that you, you get some record as input, and then you pr produce zero or more outputs as a result. And there's really no, they don't really have any relation to any of the other mappings that are going on. Because remember, this is happening in parallel, multiple threads, multiple machines. You're really just generating, here's one, one input, here's some outputs. So maybe you're changing the cardinality of the stream as it comes through, but you're not really doing anything to bring it to rest or anything. Uh, so again, I would advocate that, that the output of mapped, then, is a stream. Uh, and so then, next up is map write. So map write takes a stream in and produces something. Uh, and that something, then, is later cons consumed by the reduce phase. So let's now look at the, the reduce signature and figure out what's happening here. So we had the stream produced by the submitter. And what's, what we're getting in, then, on the reduce side uh, is a single key uh, of the type from the emitter, and then an iterable with all of the values for that key. So what's happened here in between the map and reduce phases is that we've taken all of the, all of the values for a given key that may have been produced across many different machines, and we've brought them to rest in a single location so that we could hand them off as a single package to this single reduce call, saying, here, for this key, here's all the values that are produced for it. That sounds an awful lot like that sort of aggregating things together, grouping things together thing that we talked about earlier, right? So I'd argue that the, the output of, of, map, of map write is a table. So then that brings us into the reduce phase, which actually looks a lot like the map phase. You, you, you might, given the names, think that they're you know, very different in some way. They're really not. The, the reduce phase is basically a, another map phase. It just happens to be given this large iterable of values. So we actually won't spend time talking about it, because it looks almost identical. Um, there's a little bit of interesting stuff at reduce write, but um, it's not worth discussing here. Um, and so with this, I think we, we have enough information now to answer the first two questions. So how does, how does batch processing fit into all of this? Well, tables are read into streams. Streams are processed until a new stream. Tables are processed into new streams until a grouping operation is hit. Grouping turns the stream into a table, and then you repeat steps one through three until you run out of operations. And MapReduce does this twice and calls it a day. And then the second question, what is the relationship of streams to bounded and unbounded data sets? Well, streams are just the in-motion form of data, whether it's bounded or unbounded. All right, so now we, we understand how, how batch processing relates to streams and tables. Now let's, let's go a little deeper and look at uh, kind of more complicated stream processing concepts within the, the way that Beam approaches them. Um, so we'll go through these four questions again, but, but as we do it this time, we're going to look at a concrete example. We're going to look at uh, a real pipeline uh, written in Beam code, and then we're going to look at uh, some data plotted uh, on a graph here uh, with a couple, and within a couple dimensions of time. And, and so this, this bears some explanation. So what we're doing here is these nine circles, consider these as being scores uh, from some like mobile team game. So we've got some mobile game, you know, users are crushing candy or, or killing orcs or whatever. Uh, and when various users on a team uh, sc ha uh, sc score, uh, their phone reports that score back to our servers. Uh, and we want to aggregate the scores of all the people on a team and figure out what is the team's overall score. And the, and the, you know, the, the, users, the users on a team could be spread out across the world, and they're on devices that could go online or offline. So these scores happen at a certain point in time. Uh, that's the event time. That's the x-axis. So if you were to read these from left to right, you would see them. That would be reading them in the order that they actually happen. So 5, 9, 7, 8, 3, 4, 3, 8, 1. That's, that's the, the ordering within time that they happen. But because we're dealing with mobile devices and distributed systems and slower and faster networks and all sorts of fun stuff like that, uh, when the system actually goes or gets around to aggregating these things together, it, it may see them in a, in a wildly different order. And so that's what we call processing time. That's the time at which the system actually sees it. And if you read from bottom to top, since processing time is the y-axis, you'd see what specific ordering we happen to get here. And in this case, it's 5, 7, 3, 4, 8, 3, 9, 8, 1. The important point here is that you know, if, if, if everything just happened at, at, at the ideal, you know, that as soon as a record, as soon as a, a score happened, it was, it was recorded and processed, then everything would lie on this dashed white line. But in reality, while you have some things like this three that are relatively close to the line, you have some things like the nine that, that are further away from it and have more skew from the ideal. And so you end up with records that, that may show up later than, than you'd expect. All right, so let's make this a little more concrete and, and look at a specific example. So we'll start out with the first question, what results are calculated? So let's just approach this as like a, a typical batch processing problem. We've got these nine scores. Let's just sum them up into a single team score. Uh, so this is a reasonable Java code-ish for uh, a Beam pipeline to do this. It's, it's reading in data from some I.O. source. 
applying some parsing function uh, to parse those into a user, well, I guess it's a team and a score for individual user scores. And then we're going to sum those integer scores by key. The key is the team. So we'll end up with a single score for the team. Uh, so now let's look at an animation of what this actually looks like in action. And there's a lot going on here, so I'll kind of describe it. So again, we've got the event time axis, axis is the y axis. Processing time is, is the, or, excuse me, event time is the x axis, processing time is the y axis. And you can see the records, they kind of scroll downward as, as time moves forward. This is kind of like those piano roll things. So just as time progresses, the, the records move downward. Uh, and you can see that we, we start out, uh, and I've annotated on the left, actually, what the, uh, what the different types of data are. So we start out with input bytes. They hit our parsing operation, and they get transformed into the numbers. They're parsed into the actual scores, right? Uh, and then those user scores are summed together. They hit that summation operation, and they, they get added up to the final score. Uh, and then since this is batch processing, remember, we, we just continue adding scores until we get to the end of the input. And finally, when the end of the input is reached, uh, at that point in time, we finally produce a, a final output, the value of 48, that is the team score. Uh, and I've annotated on the, on the right side uh, the, the state that the, the data are in at any, at any given point. So you can see they start out as a, a stream of input bytes. They hit that parsing function, and the parsing function uh, does nothing to stop the, the stream that's in motion, right? It just kind of converts these raw bytes into a, into a single value, and it keeps flowing down. And it's not until they get to the grouping operation, this, this summation, aggregation, that the, the, the records in the stream actually come to rest and sit there uh, and accumulate. And it isn't until we, we reach the end of the input that we produce an output. Um, so this kind of gives you a sense for how the data flow or, or pause and then flow again within the pipeline. Uh, and the types of, uh, the, you know, whether they're streams or tables and, and how they transition between those. So let's, let's make this a little more interesting and start to move forward through the other questions. So where in event time are, are results calculated? So what I mean by this is uh, typically uh, we talk about windowing with event time. And so windowing divides data into event time-based finite chunks. Because when you're dealing with unbounded streams in particular, it can be nice to partition data into finite sections that you can reason about. And these are three examples of, of different types of windowing that you might come across, tumbling or fixed, where you bas basically slice up time into these fixed uh, windows of time across all the data. Um, hopping or sliding is very similar, except instead of having uh, each of the windows be you know, distinct, you kind of hop or slide a little bit, so they end up overlapping. Um, and then sessions, uh, this last one here on, on the right, is particularly interesting because it's uh, these are windows that are derived from the data. So we usually define sessions as, you know, say you're monitoring user behavior and a user's on, you know, traveling a website or, or something. And so you've got a bunch of events from a, a given user. And you'll, you'll say, well, I, I care about sessions, you know, where I've got activity, you know, each event happens within, say, one minute of each other. So maybe you've got 12 different things that the user did on your website. And each of those 12, 12 actions happened within one minute of uh, one of the other actions within, the, within that sequence. And then finally, you get to the end, and nothing happens. You know, the user walks away from their computer or whatever, uh, and nothing happens for more than a minute. You say, OK, all of those records that, that happened within a minute of each other, that's a user session. These are really useful for, for understanding you know, user engagement, you know, what, what users are actually doing. And they're really, they're really interesting from, from a systems perspective in, in the respect that you know, we can't know them ahead of time. You, you have to see the data in order to figure them out. Uh, and they're, they're different for a given user. They're not the same across every user, right? Like each user is going to have their own types of sessions. Uh, so these are different types of windowing. Uh, and if we wanted to window our, uh, our summation of, of team scores here, we could do something like this in Beam, just apply a, a windowing operator. So in this case, we're going to window into fixed two-minute windows. And if we were to go back to the animation and see what that does, it looks pretty similar until you get to uh, the summation operation. And there you can see, instead of summing them all up into just a single value of 48, it's broken apart into two-minute event time window slices. So we basically said, we're now getting the team scores for each of these two-minute windows of event time. And as before, since it's still batch processing, we kind of sum up the scores. Uh, and once we finally reach the end of the input, then we say, well, here's the, here are the values for all of the output, or for all of the windows uh, that we computed. So this is all well and good when you have bounded data source. But if you're going to deal with unbounded data, like we can't, as I said before, can't wait for the end of the input. Like it may never end. We really would prefer an incremental way of getting output. 
And so for that, we want to move on to the third question of, of when in processing time are results calculated. And so there's really two, two aspects to this. So triggers are, are kind of the way that you control uh, when results are emitted. They're a way of uh, declaring, hey, at this point in time, you should give me results. And there's really kind of two main categories of triggers. There's kind of re periodic repeated updates. So you know, uh, give me an update every minute or, or every hour or, or every day. Um, this kind of gives you that eventual consistency sort of materialized view sort of feel of things. Um, and then the other are, are completeness triggers. Um, that's effectively what we've been using with batch processing is, is trigger when the input is complete, right? But if you have an unbounded data source, you end up tweaking the definition of completeness to be, you know, give, produce output when, you know, the input for a given window is complete. So I've kind of sliced up time and said, you know, I just care about this specific window. Give me, give me output when that's complete. Uh, and so to reason about that level of completeness within a stream, we often use a thing called a watermark. And a watermark just tries to track the completeness of your, your unbounded infinite data source relative to some point in time. Uh, and watermarks can be either perfect or heuristic. So a perfect watermark is an absolute guarantee that, you know, say if the watermark is at, is at 1 p.m., that you'll never see an event uh, with an event time before 1 p.m. But a perfect watermark requires perfect knowledge of all of the input sources, and that's often impractical, particularly for our example, say, where we've got mobile devices that might go offline, or airplane mode for a long time. Like, there's just no practical way to know when you're going to have all of the inputs coming in. So in those cases, you often need to use a heuristic watermark, where you use all the information that's available to kind of make a best guess. Um, so let's go ahead and add, uh, add in a, an explicit watermark trigger here to our pipeline. So we'll say we'll trigger when the watermark passes the end of a, of a given window. And let's see what this looks like when we run it on a streaming engine. So again, it looks very similar to before, but now we've got this green meandering line here that's representing our watermark. So that's representing the system's system's idea of, of where the input completeness is. And we're, we're using a heuristic watermark here because remember, we got mobile devices. Um, and so what happens then is, is you see, we, as before, we kind of accumulate values uh, at the summation operation. But once the watermark passes the end of the window, that's when we choose to actually produce output. And what's nice about this is you can see you get this kind of cascading flow of, of results. And this is how you can incrementally get results over time without having to wait until all of the input is complete. You just wait until enough of the input is complete. Um, a downside is that, as you can see, our heuristic was not 100% correct, and we missed that value of 9 for the first window. Right? The, the, the answer should have been 14, but we provide a, a, an answer of 5. Uh, and so in order to deal with the fact that we had a, uh, this late record of 9 show up, we need to do something. And we've got kind of two options there. So one is, if you've heard of the, the queryable state thing that, that the Kafka folks or the, the Flink folks have talked about, um, if you, if you look at our state table here where we're doing the summation, the, the value of 14 actually is in there. Even though we gave an answer of, of 5 in the stream that we sent downstream, the, the correct value eventually ends up there. And, and the idea of queryable state is if you, know, if you have the ability to just poll your state to find out you know, what a current value is, and you can just always poll whenever you want to know what the, the, latest, the latest result is, you can just go and look in the state table. You don't actually need to produce a stream. You, don't, you kind of don't have to deal with this whole late data thing. Like you can just wait for eventual consistency to kick in and, and get the right answer. Um, that's all well and good if you can poll, but there are a lot of cases where you can't. You can't sit and poll every key to see, oh, is there an update here? You know, so for, for use cases where you want to get notifications, where you need to really push things downstream, that's where you need to have a, a different approach, and that's where we, we want to modify our trigger uh, to be able to give us an updated answer. So for that, we'll move to the last question of how do refinements of results relate? Uh, and so with this, what we're going to do is we're going to modify the trigger to, to add in late firings. We're going to say, OK, give me, give me a trigger firing when the window is complete. And if any late data show up, just give me an updated value. And, and we'll do so with this accumulating mode saying, accumulate the values together. So, so build upon the previous results. So uh, in this example, we'll, we'll say the first answer will be 5. And then when that late 9 shows up, we'll give you the, the correct answer of 14 that builds upon that, that 5. So you can see this looks basically the same as before, except in the case of the late record, we go ahead and give a late answer as well. Uh, and in this way, we, we are, we're able to push an answer downstream without requiring the user to sit there and, and continually poll to see what the results are. And so what we've done here is we've walked through four different uh, approaches to uh, you know, adding up user scores into a team score across a, you know, four very different use cases, you know, kind of the classic batch just consuming all the input and getting a single output, 
uh, doing, get, you know, windowing with, into event time to kind of view our data over time, uh, adding and streaming in order to get our results incrementally, which is particularly useful when you want to start dealing with unbounded data sets, uh, and then adding in late data handling to also be able to have a, you know, a stream that, that copes well with heuristic watermarks and, and records showing up late and things like that. So with this, I, I think we have enough uh, to, to answer this last question of how do streams and tables relate to, to kind of robust stream processing as, as we advocate for it in Beam. Um, and the answer to that, I would say, is this, this more general theory of stream and table relativity, which is pipelines are composed of tables and streams and operations on those. Tables are data at rest, streams are data in motion. Uh, and operations take a stream or a table as an input and provide a stream or a table as an output. This kind of uh, ignores the fact that you might have multiple inputs or outputs, but it generalizes. Um, and there's four types of operations, stream-to-stream so -stream operations. These are the non-grouping or element-wise operations. These leave your stream data in motion, yielding another stream. There's stream-to-table operations. These are your grouping operations. They, they bring the stream data to rest, yielding a table. And windowing is just another dimension of, of grouping. There's really nothing more to it than that. Uh, and then there's table-to-stream operations. These are the ungrouping or triggering operations. And these put table data into motion, yielding a new stream. And the accumulation uh, dictates the nature of the stream, whether it's deltas or, or accumulating values or there's retractions in there. Uh, and then lastly, there's table-to-table -table operations, which don't exist because it's impossible to go from rest to rest without being put into motion. And so with that, we're, we're kind of done talking about streams and tables. We have a, a decent foundation. So now let's, let's finally start talking about SQL. And to begin with, let's talk about relational algebra. So relational algebra is this mathy thing that underpins SQL. And it's, the idea is basically, you know, you have these things called relations, which are these two-dimensional sets of data. You've got the columns that are kind of attributes, uh, and you've got rows, which are, are the values for those attributes. Uh, so in this case, we've got, again, kind of user scores. Uh, we've got three scores from Julie and one score from Frank and the times that they, that they happened. Uh, and you can apply opera relational operators to these relations, right? And so in this case, we, we apply a projection operation and project that, table, that relation down to just the score and time columns. Uh, and so it drops the user column. It works as you expect. One of the great things about relational algebra is that it's a closed system. So any relational operator can be applied to any, you know, that can be validly applied to a relation yields another relation on the other side. You don't have to worry about, like, you know, what, what is the kind of the, the nature of the data after I apply this operator? Like, you always get a, uh, another relation, which means you can arbitrarily nest and chain these things, which is really handy. Um, and of course, SQL, as we know, is this physical manifestation then of relational algebra, where you can select score time from user scores and, and get the same expected result as you would from, from the relational algebra. Um, so if we want to uh, figure out how relational algebra relates to streaming, the key point here is that streaming really deals with data over time, right? And, and relations themselves evolve over time. So if we were to, qu to query our, our relation that I showed you originally at different points in time, it would look different because it's changing, right? So at 12 o'clock, there'd be nothing in it. Uh, at 12.01, Julie's first score would have arrived. If we queried it at 12.03, we'd have Julie's, two of Julie's scores plus Frank's score. And then finally, if we queried it at, at 12.07, we would have Julie's all of Julie's scores as well as Frank's scores. Um, and so this is the key insight for, for thinking about streaming and relational algebra. You know, classic SQL deals in classic relations, which, which deal with a single point in time. They're kind of a snapshot of a table at, at one point in time. So if you want to deal with streaming, streaming SQL, you, you need to deal with these things called time-varying relations. And they, they deal with uh, a relation as it exists at every point in time. So what do I mean by that? So we already saw our, our, this sort of sequence of classic relations for our, our small little relation with, with four scores in it, right? Well, a time-varying relation, with, like let's say we had a system where you could show up and say, I'm going to do a query, and I want you to give me back a time-varying relation. If we were to show up to that system and query it for the time-varying relation for this relation at 1207, it'd give us back this thing that looks an awful lot like that sequence of classic relations, but it's a single three-dimensional object kind of flattened into 2D because of the constraints of projection. Uh, but it captures the entire history of that relation as it's existed in all of time, right? And what's really cool about this is if you think, well, okay, now I've got this time-bearing relation, I want to do things with it. If you want to apply a relational operator to it, 
that would be essentially identical as, as applying that relational operator to each of the classic relations that we had above. And if you were to do that, you'd get back a new sequence of classic relations that just were, you know, those relations with the operator applied. And that sequence of new classic relations would themselves be a time-bearing relation. And the result you can, you can derive from this is that the closure property of relation algebra remains intact even when you're dealing with time-bearing time relations. And this is really important, because this means literally everything that you can do within SQL, you can do in streaming SQL, which is not something that I think everybody intuitively have, has thought over the, over the, the years. Um, so let's see some examples of this. So again, let's talk about our original, we've got our select star relation here. Um, so let's try filtering. So let's add a where clause. So let's filter it down just to Julie's scores. It looks exactly as you'd expect. You, know, you just take the, the time-bearing relation we had before, and you filter out Frank anywhere that uh, Frank's scores existed. Um, filtering's pretty easy in streaming. Let's look at grouping. Grouping kind of trips people up sometimes. So let's group by name, sum of the scores, max the times. Again, this, this looks exactly as you'd expect. It's just sort of a sequence of, of classic relations where you've just taken all, you know, anytime you had multiple scores for the same user, you've summed them up and max the times, and, and that's what you get. So this is all well and good, um, but it's not particularly practical, right? Like you're not going to go to a system and, and, and query for a time-bearing relation and, and see what you know these things look like over all of time. Like this is this is almost intractable with our little four-record relation over a seven-minute span. If you actually get thousands or millions of records, this is just not going to be practical. Um, what we'd really like is to to really deal in terms of streams and sort of classic tables as we had in the past. So how does all this stuff relate to that? Well, we've already essentially defined time-bearing relations in terms of tables. So, th so from a table perspective, that's pretty straightforward. So imagine that we have a special keyword now to say select a table. You know, we're, we're still dealing in time-bearing relations, but let me select a table here. Uh, and you can see if you select at different times, you get different views of it. Um, what's particularly interesting is, you know, say we wanted to see what the table looked like at 1201. Well, you could query it at 1201 to see that. Uh, but that's not the only way. There's actually precedence in the SQL standard. Uh, you can query as of system time 1201 uh, at a later time, say 1207, and still get back what that table looked like at 1201. Um, so there's already within the SQL standard kind of a notion of these time-varying relations, you know, temporal tables evolving over time. Um, but let's look at streams. So imagine you had this special select stream keyword. So let's select this as a stream. What does it look like? Well, it looks a lot like if we had selected it as a table. Uh, the only difference I have here is that there's a little ellipsis at the end instead of it being closed off, which means you know, we've started the query, but we're not done yet. There's going to be more data because we're selecting a stream and it's unbounded, and we'll just kind of sit here and wait for results to show up. So if we let time advance a minute, then Julie's first score will show up. And if we compare that to the table version, we look awfully similar, similar at this point in time. Um, so let's let time advance a couple more minutes. And you can see at this point now, Frank's score has showed up, and Julie's second score has showed up. And remember, we're, we're doing the, the grouping, summing, maxing operation here, right? And so what we're getting now is a stream that's saying, you know, originally we had Julie's uh, total score was seven, but now since her second record of one, her, of one had showed up, we've summed it up, uh, and we have that there. And if you compare that to the table version, they're starting to look different now, right? Like the, the table version shows you at this point in time, this is what exists in the table. The stream version kind of shows you this history of changes. It's the evolution of the values within the table. And if we advance time more, you know, this becomes even more, more and more clear that these two are diverging. And this is really important. So there, there are some systems that have advocated that you know, just treat streams and tables as the same thing. They're, they're identical. You don't have to worry about it. Everything will work out fine. And in as much as the underlying primitive within relational algebra is this time-varying relation thing, that's true, but when you actually want to go and materialize something as a stream or a table, they end up looking very different. And this is really important to keep in mind because you need to know, you know what you're going to be dealing with if you want things to turn out right. Um, so how does this all relate to streams and tables? Well, tables capture a point-in-time snapshot of a time-varying relation, and streams capture the evolution of a time-varying relation over time. So that brings us to the last section. So this is, we're finally going to talk about SQL and language extensions, which is possibly what you expected this talk was going to be about. I have all of two slides on it. Um, we'll spend like two minutes here. Um, when do you need SQL extensions for streaming? Well, extensions are actually kind of undesirable. Like, 
you don't want to have to learn new concepts. You really don't want to have to deal with them. And until they get into the standard, which takes years, then they're you know, not uniformly applied across all, all various systems. Like you, you just don't want extensions if you can avoid it. So the nice thing is if you choose good defaults, they're often not needed. Um, and it really depends on how you're materializing or consuming the output. So if you're consuming the output as a table, extensions are rarely needed. I mean, SQL is a very table-biased system. It's, it's evolved over multiple decades, you know, focused on tables. It's really if you want to materialize things as a stream that extensions sometimes become needed. Um, and so this is kind of a summary of the main things that I think are really relevant uh, if you want to talk about what extensions would be useful for streaming SQL. We already talked about the uh, table and stream selectors. So if you want to specifically say, I want this as a table, or I want this as a stream, this lets you choose what that materialization looks like. Um, but you can choose, you could choose some reasonable defaults that would kind of keep you from having to specifically say whether you want this at any given, any given point in time. So if, if, if all the inputs are tables, you probably want the output to be a table. And this is basically what classic SQL has had all along. It'd be weird to break that. Uh, but if any of the inputs are streams, it's probably reasonable to have the output be a stream because you've got this unbounded thing as one of your inputs. You know, the, the, a reasonable default is probably to have you know, the, the output be unbounded by default. Um, it's useful to have support for timestamps and windowing. You know, we kind of talked about windowing and, and wanting to understand completeness with watermarks, so the system needs to be able to reason about that. So having event time columns. Um, it's nice to have kind of constructs to express windowing in a concise way. Like, you can describe fixed windows or sliding windows. You can even describe session windows in kind of raw standard SQL, but it's not easy for, for mere mortals to do. Like, a sessions is this weird self-join on analytic functions kind of a thing that I can't describe without asking somebody else. Um, so it's nice to have these, you know, kind of more concise extensions that let you say, you know, I, I want to do this thing called a session, you know, with a five-minute gap interval or whatever, and not have to understand the, the underlying complex SQL to, to define it. Uh, and then for materializing streams, it's useful to have a, a simple suite of triggers uh, to let you shape, you know, define what the shape of that stream should be. Um, these can sometimes be implicitly def implicitly defined by the characteristics of the sync that's, that's consuming the output, which is nice. Um, optionally, they can be configured outside the query. You can just have a parameter on your system that says, you know, when I do a stream query, I want updates every minute. You know, just, just do it that way. Um, otherwise, if you want to do it within SQL, you could imagine having an, an emit win clause that would allow you to select, you know, select from X, whatever, and emit, uh, you know, emit after 10 seconds, or emit when the watermark is past uh, this timestamp column. Uh, and so you can mix and match these repeated updates and completeness kind of options. Uh, and that's really, really it. Um, some of these have been implemented already in Apache Beam, Apache CalSite, and Apache Flink, um, particularly the windowing things, um, some of the selection stuff. Uh, and we're, we're cur currently working on, on adding more into those systems. Um, so to summarize, you know, we, we talked a bit about streams and tables and how they relate to one another. Uh, then we talked about how the, the, the idea of streams and tables relates to robust stream processing and, and data processing in general, as, as we've defined it in Apache Beam. Uh, we spent some time discussing time-varying relations as this unifying concept that, that allows you to, to reason about streaming within the, the, the constructs of, of SQL as they've always existed. Uh, and then we talked very briefly about the types of SQL language extensions that might be useful to support streaming within SQL. Um, and that's all I have. Um, so here's a link to these slides if you're curious. There's a few other docs that I've given links to up here. Um, the streaming SQL spec is kind of where we were hashing out a bunch of this within the, the Beam, CalSite, and, and Flink communities. It's, it's kind of a mess, honestly. We're working on a, a new doc that I hope we'll have out in a month or two uh, that will be better. Um, the streaming and CalSite link from Julian Hyde. Uh, that was Ju so Julian's kind of the founder of uh, Apache CalSite, which is a, a SQL parser system, essentially. Um, uh, that was kind of the, the, the doc that really got me excited about streaming SQL originally. Uh, and then he has the streams, joins, and temporal tables doc that if you want to just melt your mind for an afternoon thinking about temporal joins, you should sit down with that and a cup of coffee. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, Apache Beam or just sort of streaming in general, I wrote a couple of blog post articles for O'Reilly, the streaming 101 and 102. Um, and I get, I get asked a lot how I did the animations, so they're, they're rendered with LaTeX and Tix, and they're all up on GitHub if you're curious. Source code is there, including all the animations from my book. 
uh, and I'm on Twitter. And that's it. Thank you. All right. And we have some questions for you. We have about five minutes to run through some of those. So C0D3Guru, not exactly sure how to pronounce that, but apparently he's a great question asker at this conference. He asks, where does Beam sit in the ecosystem of tools such as Goblin, NiFi, and other data flow solutions? What would be a concrete use case for it in comparison to the others and why? So, so Beam is, so I'm, I'm not that familiar with Goblin. I do, I do know NiFi. But, you know, as I kind of said at the beginning, the, the real core value of Beam is as a portability framework. Um, we didn't really pitch it at, at that as, as much originally because we didn't really have the portability framework built out when we first created the project. We're still actually working on it. We, we think we'll finish everything finally this year. But you know, Beam is going to allow you to, as I said, write, write your data processing pipelines in any supported SDK in any language. So we currently have Java, Python, and Go. Uh, I've heard interest in Node.js. I've heard interest in Rust. I've heard interest in C Sharp. So I, I, and then any, of the thing, any pipeline you write in any of those languages can then be run on any of the uh, execution engines that we support. So we're, we'll support Flink. We'll support Spark, Google Cloud Dataflow. We've got a gear pump runner. A SAMSA runner was recently added. We have others. I think a Storm runner has been in the works. Um, so this ability to, to portably have pipelines written in any language and then run on any of these you know, kind of first class execution engines is really what, what Beam brings to the table. And that's very different than, you know, NiFi itself is kind of a, an execution system. Most of these systems that, that are mentioned really are, are systems that allow you to process data. They're, they're not kind of trying to pair up languages and runners and provide portability. So that's kind of where Beam sits. All right, and it, you already answered the question from Vindabona, but it's a cool name. So you, yeah, you, we know what you used for animations. Andor asks, can one process data at rest as a stream? Group by key is a con congestion point for massive data sets. Can one process data at rest as a stream? So you can't, I mean, I think what's, what's being asked here is, is sort of, I feel like the question behind the question is, how can you deal with you know, this sort of hotkey problem or you know, congestion problems of, I've got, like, say I've got, say I'm looking at, at you know, search feed and summing up uh, you know, sort of traffic by, say, web browser. You know, some low cardinality thing, you're doing a group by key over low cardinality with, with massive input, you inevitably end up with these, these massive hotkeys, right? Um, there's really no way around it. Like, you're, you're trying to do an aggregation. You're trying to bring those data to rest as a table. And it's just the simple fact that you have so many of them is what causes the congestion. And there, I, I don't think there is a way ar around that. Like, I mean, the, there are certainly tricks that you can do, right? Like, if you're, you're performing an associative commutative operation, you can spread it out, kind of do partial, partial combines ahead of time, and then combine those partial results together. That's what folks typically do. But, um, I don't think there's any magic formula for, for working around that kind of stuff. All right, maybe we have time for one last one from Livani. Any major difference between Apache Beam SQL and K SQL? So there's a big, so sort of the, the underlying difference is that the K SQL, they wrote their own SQL parser. Uh, Beam SQL uses Apache Calcite, which is the, the SQL parser used for for Hive, and Flink uses it, a whole bunch of Apache projects make use of it. So that's kind of a, a, an interesting underlying difference. Um, KSQL, I think the, the, the major difference between what we're, where we're trying to go with, with Beam and Flink SQL uh, versus KSQL is KSQL is very focused on the materialized view approach. So uh, basically, the, the only thing you can do as far as materializing data into tables is this repeated update trigger. So you say, you know, I want, I want updates every minute or updates every hour or whatever. They don't do completeness uh, triggers, which means you can't really tackle these notification type uh, use cases uh, as well. I think that's the major difference because other than that, like you've got, you know, grouping and windowing and, you know, most of the, most of everything else in SQL just kind of applies. Um, so most of, the, most of the rest of the systems are going to be relatively similar. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you.